Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. I'm back once again interviewing my favorite guest. And of course, he means me. <laughs> That's right. You've become my favorite guest on this program. I don't know why I'm so fond of you. Today, we're going to talk about living in the afterlife. What's it like, really? We did a video not long ago with Stafford Betty, a good friend who has been on this program several times, and that title was called Life in the Afterlife. It was based on a work of fiction that he had created, but the work of fiction was based on a lot of historical information, uh, accounts from the spiritualist literature primarily that he had been studying. Now, for viewers of the New Thinking Aloud series, you may know there's in our listings page, you'll find about a hundred, a hundred video interviews concerned with life after death. So, what I'd like to focus on today is what have we learned? If you've been watching those videos or if you're curious as to what I've gleaned from them, that's what we're going to look at today. And I think it's fair to say one of the most interesting conversations I had was with a progressive spiritualist medium, Karen Frances McCarthy, a fascinating lady who was a war correspondent working in Iraq when her fiancé was killed. I shouldn't say killed, he died when her fiancé died. It wasn't like a murder. But after that, he began manifesting in her life. And as a result of the continued after-death communications, or ADCs as they're known, she became a spiritualist medium. And she even went over to the Arthur Findlay College in England to study. And uh, that is a college which is part of the official spiritualist religion, the National Spiritualist Union, I guess it would be called. I'm not 100% sure, not being a spiritualist myself, but she raised a very interesting point in our conversation, which was that she was very unhappy with the notion that many mediumistic circles get involved with, and I've done an interview about it, as a matter of fact, it's sometimes referred to as soul rescue. The idea there being that there are spirits who get lost in the afterlife and they need a little help moving into the light. They, for one reason or another, they're attached to the earthly plane. They may be pestering somebody, possessing somebody, obsessing somebody on the physical plane, and they, they need to move on. Or maybe they're just hiding. They don't want to go to hell, for example, and they, they need to be guided uh, to move on to their own possible spiritual evolution. And there are these rescue circles that work. There's quite a large literature about it. And Karen Francis McCarthy took issue with the entire practice. Yes, I thought it was fascinating, especially since, in retrospect, uh, a lot of the data that I got about this uh, rescue circle work came from her publisher, John Beecher, who I've interviewed as, as well. Now, Karen's point, though, I think was well taken, which is, she said, how can you be anywhere where God is not? So that people who die, they are always surrounded by God, which means I think you could say the heavenly host, friends and relatives and helpers and guides, angelic figures, they're there. They're always there to help. And I think she's actually right about that. On the other hand, what if the newly deceased person doesn't want their help? 
for any number of a variety of reasons, is afraid of, of their help. Because my sense is that when we enter the afterlife, and I want you to say this very clearly now because this is one of the most important points you're about to make. Well, I'm about to make. When we enter the afterlife, what we experience is very largely based on our own personal psychology. So, for example, if you're a person who has been raised to be afraid of going to hell, and if you know that you've done something for which you feel guilty, let's not even say whether it was a sin or not, but if you feel guilty, you're afraid of going to hell. Which reminds me of a, uh, uh, an episode, a brief moment in an interesting conversation I had with Joseph Gallenberger when he's describing the soul rescue work that is being done under the auspices of the Monroe Institute in Virginia, where people are trained to enter into out-of-body states. I should say the out-of-body state <laughs> It's very much akin to the near-death state, only you're not near death. You don't have to be near death to enter into a spiritual realm. In the out-of-body state, at least in the more profound ones, people are uh, in a state uh, very much akin to the near-death state. In fact, Robert Monroe has mapped it out in quite some detail. Uh, the point being, that in this story that Joseph Gallenberger told, well, can I tell it? In this story, uh, a woman is in the early stages of the afterlife. She's looking around um, and she sees this lump. She's drawn towards the lump. She moves towards the lump. And as she approaches the lump, she realizes why it's her father. And her father seems to awaken as she approaches him and she is able to converse with him. Well, what are you doing here? He says, I'm hiding. She says, well, why? She says, aren't there guides? Aren't there helpers who will take you into, into the next stage? He says, yeah, but I'm hiding from them. I don't want to go to hell. So, that is a condition that people get into in the early stages of the afterlife. They're, they're all of uh, this, this conditioning. I'll give you another example. Well, let me give it this time. It has to do with reincarnation. It's very interesting. All across Asia, the belief in reincarnation is quite common. And the belief is that it happens right away. You know, you die and you get reincarnated almost instantly. So, we find in the research that of Asian cases of reincarnation, cases where young children remember their previous lives, and in a roughly half of those cases, we're able to identify from their memories who the previous person was. So, we now know the length of time that transpired between the death of the previous person and the conception and birth of the new person. And in Asian cases, it can be just a short time, like a couple of months. Whereas in Western cases of reincarnation, where it's a kind of rare belief, or at least it used to be in the West, I think that's changing. And uh, that'll probably show up. Those cultural changes will show up in our statistics. The length of time between incarnations in the West is many, many months, maybe uh, 18 to 30 months, something like that, maybe longer. So, what we can say for a fact is that your experience in the early stages of the afterlife is very much conditioned upon your psychology and your psychology in this instance is conditioned upon belief systems, your expectation. The early stages of the afterlife is very much about what you expect it to be. Later stages, not necessarily so. And another interesting feature in this regard is that in the Asian cases, when they die, they don't travel at least uh, in particular the ones in Sri Lanka, Burma, and India, which have been uh, studied most extensively, 
after death, they don't necessarily go to heaven occasionally. Uh, they do go into a heavenly realm with spiritual beings, Yama, the Lord of Death, for example. But very often, they spend their afterlife hanging out in a tree or in a calabash or in, in uh, an outhouse even, waiting, or a river, waiting for somebody to pass by so that they can immediately attach themselves to that person, that family, and get reborn right away. Whereas uh, that's not part of the Western mindset. So you have uh, some real distinctions going on in terms of the mindset. You also see as people enter into the afterlife, we have in our three dimensions of space, up, down, right, and left, back, and forward, and in one dimension of time, moving from past into present into future. Those are our dimensions, but in the realm of consciousness, I know at least one other very important dimension which we could call the distinction between good and evil. Yeah, the idea here is, uh, and it's an ancient idea, God comes from the word good. God is the ultimate source of goodness. God is the purest good of good of all good. It's uh, God is like embracing everything, loving everything. I've talked about this quite a bit. That uh, is an experience that each and every one of us is capable of embracing the entire universe in its totality. That takes a cosmic perspective because normally on the earthly plane, we have the, this idea of good and evil. The, you know, you're supposed to hate the devil and love God, but God loves the devil. Why would God love the devil? Because the devil is ultimately God's own creation. That's a profound thought, uh, and I'm not going to dwell on it right now, because I want to talk about the other extreme as, as well. Indeed, in the realm of consciousness, you have, as, as we've talked about, the, the epitome of goodness, which is our definition of God, but there's also the epitome of evil. That's part of what it means to be conscious, is to hate, is to have disgust for oneself, disgust for one's fellow creatures, the desire to hurt, to destroy, to punish, to seek revenge, to create strife and conflict and warfare. That is also what it means to be conscious is to have those feelings as well. So the spectrum of consciousness in the, you could, let's call it the astral plane for the moment, the spectrum of consciousness in the astral plane includes the highest good and the worst of all possible felonies and evils. It's all there. It's the, that's the potential of our human consciousness. And what all of this implies, of course, is that there's a perspective, as Nietzsche said, beyond good and evil. That doesn't mean that one endorses or embraces evil in any sense whatsoever. And I think to my meager understanding of Nietzsche, Nietzsche did not advocate violence or war or evil in any sense to my knowledge, but he did advocate breaking free of the local cultural constraints around it because you'll see very often when it comes to, I'm going to call them tribal cultures. Tribal cultures usually say whatever is good for the tribe is good. Whatever is bad for the tribe, that's evil. And sometimes inflicting evil on others is good for the tribe. <laughs> So, evil becomes good and good can become evil in a tribal context. That's, that's one of the problems with tribalism. It's one of the problems, you might say, with life in the physical plane. And by that, I mean it's because we live in a world of duality. Well, I've been carrying on for a while now, and I know that I've touched on a lot of questions. I've raised a lot of interesting issues that are still, I would imagine, in the mind of many viewers right now, still unresolved, as well they should be. 
So what I'm going to do, I'm going to close this discussion pretty soon. Pretty soon meaning in a few moments, I guess. I'm going to close this discussion pretty soon. But what I want you to know is I'm going to come back to it. So let's call this episode part one of living in the afterlife. And uh, I want to come back and, and follow up on some of these points, uh, which I'll be doing soon. So for now, I want to thank you, those of you who have been with me, for being with us. Yes, indeed. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.